Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to you all this Thursday morning. My name is Peter McLaren, and I'm taking morning prayers this week with the help of my wife, Christy. We're both readers or licensed lay ministers in the parish of St. Peter's, Ipsley. So we'll start our morning prayer this morning with the psalm of the day. And one of the psalms set for today is Psalm 53. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Corrupt are they and abominable in their wickedness. There's no one that does good. God has looked down from heaven upon the children of earth to see if there is anyone who is wise and seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way, all alike have become corrupt. There is no one that does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, these evildoers, who eat up my people as if they ate bread and do not call upon God? There shall they be in great fear, such fear as never was, for God will scatter the bones of the ungodly. They will be put to shame because God has rejected them. Oh, that Israel's salvation will come out of Zion. When God restores the fortunes of his people, then will Jacob rejoice and Israel be gathered. Be glad. And we're reminded this morning that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So a prayer of confession. Without you, O God, nothing is real. All things are open to corruption and we are deadened by deceit. Do not abandon us to our folly, but give us hearts to seek you. And at the last, joy in your heavenly city, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So this week in our prayers, we may bring in on some of the 20 or two Zoom lessons I have taught the Year 12 and Year 13 students at the school I teach in Aston, in Birmingham. I trust you found the different approach instructive, and perhaps its help will help you to remember to pray for any students you know at this critical time of their careers, especially since in the next two months the students will be having their external exams. And for most students, this will be the first time they have had a formal external exam, since for the last two years grading has been mainly done by teacher assessment due to the difficulties of education during the time of COVID. And when I add to the material I used in school, I will pre preface it with morning prayer note. And at the end of the comment, end of note. So we started our thoughts about events in the life of Jesus with one of his parables. Part of the parable of the lost, the lost sheep. We're going to look today at his performing of miracles. These varied from stilling a storm when the disciples were nearly swamped in Luke 8, to healing a man who'd been let down through a flat roof and forgiving his sins as well. Today, however, we're going to look at perhaps one of the best known of the miracles, the raising 
of Lazarus. But first, there is a little trap we must avoid. There are two people called Lazarus in the Christian New Testament. One of them was a character in a parable of Jesus. The other, and he was a poor beggar. We are not considering him today, but if you're interested in his story, you can find it in Luke chapter 16, verses 18 to 31. So back to the story of our Lazarus, which is told to us by the writer of the fourth gospel, John, in chapter 11 of his work. And the story has four parts. Setting the scene, confronting the sisters, the raising of Lazarus, and the reaction. So setting the scene of this event. The events took place in the third year of the public ministry of Jesus, when he was aged about 33. Now Jesus had some good friends, two sisters, Martha and Mary, and their brother Lazarus. They were special friends of Jesus, and he had had several special meals in their house. You find one described in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, and another in John 12. Their house was about three kilometers southeast of Bethlehem in a small village called Bethany. And these events have been very important. As a result of the events that took place there, certain Christian churches have used the name in their title even today. A small church may be called Bethany Chapel, and the name of Bethany is still used as a girl's name today. Question, are you named? after a particular person or event? Find out about that person and event. Now Lazarus had taken ill and his sister sent a message to Jesus who was a day's walk away. Your special friend is ill, was the message. Now we don't know if this was a written message or whether a messenger was sent. Isa, Jesus, gave his disciples an odd reply. He said, this illness does not lead to death, but it is for the glory of God. Jesus stayed where he was for two more days and then told the disciples they should go back to Bethany. The disciples wondered why Jesus would go back to the place where the religious leaders were against him. But Jesus told the disciples plainly that Lazarus had died. So off they went. As Jesus approached Bethany, information began to flow. Someone told Jesus that Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. In those days, in Jewish tradition, like Muslim tradition today, burial should be within a day of death, if possible. Hearing that Jesus was coming, Martha went out to confront Jesus. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus replied to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha retorted, I know that he will rise on the resurrection on the last day. Jesus replied with one of his most important sayings. I am the resurrection and the life. The person believing in me, even if he or she should die, will live. And everyone living and believing in me shall never die. 
Do you believe this? Martha indicated that she did. Now this is a most outstanding and astounding claim. Resurrection and life are prerogatives of God alone. And here was Jesus claiming them for himself. Either he was God in human form or he was a fraud. I suppose we'd better hear the end of the story before we decide. Morning prayer note. In John's Gospel, there are various famous sayings of Jesus, beginning with the words, I am. Like, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the bread of life. And the way that's written in the original leads scholars to believe the words imitate the words of God to Moses in Exodus 3, 14. I am who I am. I, Jesus was using for himself a title reserved to God alone. End of note. Jesus then went to the tomb, which was a cave with a stone in front of it. After a bit of discussion about the wisdom of removing the stone, as the body would have started to decay, they rolled the stone back. And after a prayer to his father, God, Jesus shouted in a voice like a megaphone. Lazarus, come forth. And yes, that megaphone is exactly the words of the Greek. And the one who came, had been dead, came out with his hands and feet still wrapped in the death cloths. Jesus made a very practical point. Unbind him and let him go. Much rejoicing followed. But years later, in an event not mentioned in the Christian Bible, Lazarus did die again, physically. There were three different event reactions to this event. The reaction. I wonder if you can guess what they would be. We're told that many of the Jews who'd come to mourn the death of Lazarus believed that Jesus was indeed the Messiah because he'd raised the dead. Some, however, went and told the religious leaders in Jerusalem, who were afraid of the political consequences from the Romans, so hatched a plan to kill Jesus. Jesus then, at that time, kept away from Jerusalem and went with his disciples 20 kilometres north to a small town called Ephraim. Well, quite a story, isn't it? And I've had to abbreviate the events a bit to fit into the time allowed. It takes quite a bit of thinking about. And if you have a further question about the events, please contact me sometime when I'm in school on a Wednesday and we can talk further. Also, there could be a secret sorrow you still have about the death of a relative or friend. I'm quite willing to listen while you tell me about it, if that would help. Morning prayer note. You see how I've tried to use this story as I teach it at school, as well to give some encouragement and pastoral support to my students. End of note. Now Chris will lead us in our morning prayers. Our morning prayers this morning takes the form of praying for those in authority, really right across the whole of society. At the end of each section, 
there will be a response and I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you could respond, hear our prayer. Before I give the response, I will pause so you can think about anyone you know who fits into the category of the people we are praying for. I'm sure when we start, it will become clear. So let us pray. Living God, you call us to pray for our leaders, to remember those set over us. So we pray now for all those in positions in authority. We pray for those in our parliament, both government and opposition. In all their decisions, give them a proper sense of the responsibility and trust it to them and grant that they may work not for themselves, but for the good of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the Queen and the Royal Family. Help them to cope with the constant glare of publicity and media interest, and to use their position wisely offering inspiration and encouragement to the nation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those in the police force, with all the dangers and difficulties their work involves. Give them integrity, courage, patience and resolve and grant them your strength and protection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for judges, barristers and jurors, for magistrates and solicitors, all those faced by complex moral and legal questions and having the power to irrevocably shape people's lives. Grant them honesty and wisdom, firmness, yet sensitivity. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. We pray for head teachers, lecturers, and all those involved in education, entrusted with shaping the lives of young people. Give them insight and understanding, the ability to communicate their knowledge in a way that enthuses their students. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for managers and directors in industry and commerce, those whose decisions will affect not just firms or businesses, but the lives of countless individuals at home and overseas. Give them the acumen they need to ensure financial success, coupled with a genuine concern for the welfare of their employees and of the wider community. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for leaders in the church, ministers, elders, bishops and deacons, all those entrusted with positions of oversight and called to teach the faith through word and deed. Grant them vision and discernment, a living knowledge of your presence and a daily sense of your guidance. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. Living God, we thank you for those who are willing to take on the often heavy burden of responsibility, the onerous privilege of leadership. Support them in their work and help them to fulfil their calling faithfully, recognising that the day will come when they have to answer to a higher authority and when you will pronounce your verdict on all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us share together now the Christian family prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. As we've been thinking in the last two days about the parables of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, tomorrow we will be looking at Jesus' teaching. This is from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6 and 7. And it's hot off the press because I've just sent the Zoom lesson into school on this a couple of hours ago. So we look forward to being with you tomorrow and wish you God's blessing in the day ahead. Goodbye. Goodbye and God bless.